What's going on guys? This is Empty Box, and I got my flame suit on because I'm about to review Project Cars 2. Talking about the PC version of the game, having not played the game with a controller because there is no reason for me to do that because that's not what I do and that's not why people come to this channel. At least that's what I'm thinking here. So as for my PC specs, i 7 6700K run at 4.5 GHz. Uh, GTX 1070 graphics card, Fantec uh, Club Sport version 2 steering wheel with the Formula Rim, and then a Oculus Rift for virtual reality. I'll talk about that a little bit later. It's largely a mix and match in terms of the footage as to whether it's monitor or uh, VR footage. So as for performance on my 2560 by 1440 monitor, uh, I'm generally looking at well over 100 FPS with high settings uh, during daytime conditions, you know, standard racing conditions. When you do get into the night or alternatively when it's raining, I can't expect it to drop around to 80 FPS with a decent sized grid. Overall, this game does run better and it is a bit more consistent in the frame rates than Project Cars 1 is as well as, particularly with the graphics, it looks largely the same. However, there is definitely a big increase in the visual clarity from the images in Project Cars 2, which is tremendously appreciated. And then when I'm switching over into virtual reality, I generally use a mix of medium and low settings and find it works pretty well without too much of a visual clarity drop off because obviously, the VR headsets are so limited in the resolution anyway, so you don't really notice that you turn the settings down all that much. Okay, jumping into the, the nuts and bolts here, beyond just the performance stuff. So obviously by now, I'm, I'm assuming everybody's probably watched a video or 12 on Project Cars 2. They've heard a lot of scuttlebutt, and I think a lot of people are very much like myself here in relation to Project Cars 2, and that was... You heard some good things about it from maybe some people that you trust or maybe people you don't trust. And then you hear some bad things from people you don't trust or you do trust. And you're just kind of like, eh, eh. So that's kind of where I'm aiming this review. Because after all, this game launched a week ago. It, it's not like it's some sort of title that came out of nowhere, so I don't need to pretend so. So I'm not going to list off all the features and everything because that would be largely pointless here. So we're going to begin this exceptionally long journey by discussing the driving. Obviously that is the foundation of any racing game of any stripe. I'm pleased to say that this game poops all over Project Cars 1 in every regard. Even at its worst, again, it poops all over Project Cars 1. When it's at its best, I will non-hesitantly put this toe-to-toe -to -toe with the currently accepted crop of PC racing simulation games. Yes, there may be things that other games do better than Project Cars 2, there may be things that Project Cars 2 does better than other games out there on the market. But again, I do think it is very much within that simulation category uh, outside of a couple of outliers. Uh, in particular, I think it really comes down to the tire types, and I can honestly say that the vintage tires, uh, stuff that's like on the Lotus 25, Lotus 49, uh, stuff of that type, you know, the yield, timey, grooved racing tires, to me, those cars always end up feeling flat and lacking in dynamics in Project Cars 2. But I really think that those cars are the outliers. Uh, you know, for example, the GT cars, you know, the GT1 cars from the 90s, uh, the GTE cars, the GT3 cars. We'll even toss in the LMP900s, uh, which are similar to the GT1 cars from the 90s, obviously. Uh, they sort of overlapped at that time, but like you're going to need to get your braking right, you know, especially trail braking and everything and your brake pedal release. That's hugely important because if you get it wrong, you can actually end up kicking out the rear end of the car, uh, upsetting the car, and you'll scrub off a lot of speed, uh, and you'll just end up going slow. Like, this is a game where driving smoothly is going to matter much more than braking super late, you know, which is one of those things that obviously should happen in a racing sim as opposed to a racing game. But really, I don't have too terribly many complaints in terms of the driving once I got everything set up and working to uh, my liking. Now, there is one area where I will say that all the cars do suffer, and that is, in my opinion, racing in the rain. I do feel like every car in the game just has too much, you know, longitudinal grip you know it, the brakes are too effective putting the power down is really incredibly easy even when the track is totally flooded uh, you know and it does sort of diminish the challenge but again yet in the hydroplaning and everything and I'll talk about rain a little bit later on uh, in greater detail like yeah it becomes a great experience but it does 
tend to feel a little bit too easy in my opinion. But uh, again, you know, <laughs> it's still fun. It's still nice to race in the rain, even if the AI is 15 seconds a lap slower than I am on a flooded track. But hey, you know, it's still fun. And for those of you guys wondering, is drifting possible? Yes, with the street cars, if you put the street compound tires, which by default it will default to a track specific compound more often than not. Uh, but if you put the street specific tires on, which are listed as the the hard tires in the game, uh, you'll find that they just, you know, easy squeezy lemon peasy have at it. And then we do come to the force feedback side of the driving experience. What you see on screen right now are the settings I am using. Once again, Fantec Club Sport version 2, Formula Rim. If you have a different steering wheel, obviously your mileage may vary. But with these settings, I'm more or less happy with the game. Uh, of course, it did take a lot of testing, tuning, tweaking, and evaluation, trying out the Jack Spade files to finally arrive at them. You know, out of the box, I didn't really come to grips fully with the force feedback and the settings, you know, 50 across the board, which is like the default. Uh, but I was kind of a little bit underwhelmed. But again, the settings are there to be tweaked and tuned. And, you know, I went through all that and finally found something that I'm happy with. Uh, I did try out the Jack Spade files as well as I mentioned. Uh, that did a lot of work for Project Cars 1. Uh, a lot of people seem to like them for Project Cars 2 as well. Uh, I didn't really have a problem with those files and for people not looking to make a bunch of tweaks I think that will be an improvement over the default standard. Uh, but you know, for me personally I prefer these settings and with these settings I find it does feel somewhat similar to Assetto Corsa only perhaps a bit lighter on center uh, with a little bit more float or play around the middle. But uh, I think some of that could also be attributed to a lack of a minimum force adjustment uh, for the force feedback, which is kind of a shame. Hopefully they'll add that in the future because that should be something that is standard here in 2017, Racing Sim World. So overall, you know, now that I've got the force feedback set up after all the the tweaking and everything, getting comfortable with the physics engine and the peculiarities of of certain things and why they happen you know the standard stuff that I have to do whenever there's a new racing sim released there's a reason why I do not believe in the idea of a two-hour trial for a racing sim like it just doesn't work it does not work for me but uh, now I've gotten more comfortable with it it's like yeah I'm very few complaints to be had and those complaints I've pretty much already voiced so on that side on the driving side of things yeah thumbs up I think they've done a pretty good job this time around so now we're done talking about the driving, let's talk about the AI. Obviously you need something to race against. We'll talk about multiplayer a little bit later on in this video because it requires a little bit of thought as to what's going to happen in the end. Uh, but the AI is, at worst, better than Project Cars 1, slightly. At best is reasonably good and capable and competent enough comparing to other titles out there on the market. Uh, you can now turn the AI over 100 difficulty, so that means if you're a faster driver, you can actually have AI that is actually challenging and competent out there to race against, which is a big plus in my book. As well as there's an aggression slider, which means that you can turn the aggression way down and hopefully not be rammed constantly by the AI like it's Project Cars 1. Those two things right there have a nice effect on the overall you know, racing experience offline. However, there are still a lot of issues. They're really slow at the start. You know, they always suffer from the same corners over and over and over again, where they're always really slow. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have the greatest player awareness. And I know, like, I've played these games long enough, guys. I know these are always issues. However, I feel like Project Cars 2 has these issues particularly bad. And it's something that they have started to work on. It's something that they uh, are going to be addressing in patches going forward. But it's going to require a lot of work to get it to work right. Uh, you know, for example... Turn one at Long Beach, the AI breaks like 15 feet earlier than what they should be doing, which makes it almost trivial to pass. Turn six and seven at uh, Road, Amer Road America, they don't even follow like the right racing line at all, and they go incredibly slow through there, so it's very easy to pass through there into turn eight. Uh, you know, Brands Hatch, you know, the second half of the circuit, they're dreadfully off the pace there. Uh, you know, I could go on and on and on and on and on. There are so many of these problem areas with the AI where they just give up and it makes for a racing experience that isn't really a racing experience and instead it's just kind of like these guys are sort of just in the way more or less. Uh, they also don't really show any inclinations to defending and it's just 
comparing to you know R Factor 2 or even Automobilista, it's underwhelming. Now comparing to a game like you know Forza or Gran Turismo or Subtle Corsa, yeah, it's it's better than those games in this sense. But I really wish they would have been able to do more because with such a focus being on the single player aspect of the game through the career mode, I think they really needed to do more here. Hopefully they'll actually fix this in future patches and bring it more in line with those games that do it even better. And because we kind of brought it up, the career mode. This is one of the big issues I had with Project Cars 1. In fact, it's what I consider absolutely doomed Project Cars 1 in my book because it made no sense there. It was just largely irrelevant because the game design that they had chose made the whole thing irrelevant. But this time around, you can start from any one of the Tier 1 through 4 series. There are six tiers. However, if you want to get into Tier 5 and 6, which are things like the Formula X series, which is basically a no-holds-barred, futuristic Formula 1-style car, uh, or the IndyCar series, the Pearly World Challenge GT3 series with the real skins of that series, you, know, you actually have to advance into those series, which I think really strikes a nice balance between giving you enough options to choose from that you can race in something that you want to race in rather than I have to race in these cars even though I don't like them, which is nice, but also making sure that there's an element of progression there that actually means something. The career mode has no effect on any unlocks or anything like that in the quick race modes or online modes, so none of that crosses over, does not matter. I really think they absolutely got it right this time and I'm happy to give them a thumbs up. Much improved over the first one here. And of course in that career mode you're going to be racing in a lot of different uh, weather as well as seasons. Uh, the seasons, you know, it changes the graphics of the trees more or less and, you know, makes it look like fall or autumn or winter or spring or summer. Uh, unfortunately I couldn't seem to find a way to get Sonoma to turn green, which is quite disappointing because it's like the one thing that this feature is like tailor made for and it doesn't seem to work. But maybe I haven't found the exact particular date where the track is green rather than brown. But uh, overall, I feel like the seasons are largely just a thing that looks cool, it sounds cool, it's a neat little feature, but not really of any substance that's particularly important. Uh, but the rain is done much better this time around than in Project Cars 2, or Project Cars 1, thanks to the addition of puddling, and therefore hydroplaning and aquaplaning. Uh, and you can actually tell when someone in front of you drives through a puddle, you can actually drive through that puddle in their tire tracks, and that guy in front of you, he's going out of control, whereas you're in control, which is actually really, really cool. It's actually really well done, and I think they've done, you know, they've created a great experience from racing in the rain, whereas in Project Cars 1, it was largely just racing in the dry only with like 95% grip, you know, it didn't really matter much. I do feel like the weather effects in terms of the visuals could be improved though. Uh, the rain spray is never particularly blinding or challenging at all. Uh, you know, the rain shield, or the, the rain on the windshield is never really all that interesting or exciting. You can see it come down in the same place time and time again. Uh, you know, it, it could be better in those areas. Sort of doubling back here alongside the seasons, uh, in the weather, you also have the ability to race in snow on any of the tracks, which means that if you want, you can go ahead and load up California Highway, which is back from Project Cars 1, and only do it in snow, therefore creating basically rally stages. Yeah! But, uh, you know, the snow is, again, the visual effects are reasonably good, but they could be a little bit better in terms of the windshield and the interaction thereof. Uh, but driving around in the snow on the winter tires it feels reasonably convincing but again there's still that issue where it seems like the cars the tires are way too quick to regain their grip very harshly and that really does put a damper on things because uh, really driving in the snow should be incredibly fun to do and it is pretty fun to do but there's just that one little detail that just kind of drives me up the wall and just sort of puts a little damper on it but otherwise, it's really fun to just take like something like the Toyota GT86 out to the Nürburgring or whatever and just slide around sideways. Just It's so easy to do. You just like, yeah, just going sideways. It's enjoyable. It's something different. Again, it doesn't really mean much to the game. It's just something that's kind of there, but... It's cool, I guess. And of course, while you're flying through that blizzard, you're going to be hearing the engine sounds, which, uh... The sounds in this game are better than Project Cars 1. I'm very, very thankful that that really incredibly annoying kachunka kachunka gearbox shift noise is gone from Project Cars 1. Very glad that's gone, but, uh... You know, the sound 
in some cases is pretty good, sound in other cases not so good. Uh, you know, I think in general the cars all sound pretty good, but it seems like some cars just don't sound like the cars they're supposed to be. For example, the Ferrari 488, you know, GTE, the GT3, you know, they sound good, but they don't sound like the car should like at all. It sounds much higher revving than what it actually is, and it sounds more like the 458 than the 488. Like, I'm not quite sure there. Uh, you know, the Indy car doesn't sound bad, but it doesn't sound like an Indy car really to me. So, it's sort of a mixed bag. They do have tire scrub and tire squeal noises, which is very communicative. Uh, and it makes it easier to figure out what the car is doing uh, and is definitely appreciated there but in general I feel like the sound is there it's not like bad enough that it's horrendously annoying like that gearbox sound from Project Cars 1 was but it is something that could be a little bit better this is certainly not race room racing experience here but again as usual I'll go ahead and have a clip at the end for you guys to decide for yourselves and a couple of other things I'd like to bring up, uh, now that we've covered the bulk of things, except for multiplayer, which will be at the end here. Um, Rallycross. Surprisingly enjoyable, although, again, sort of similar to Dirt Rally, Dirt 4, I assume, as well. Uh, I wouldn't say there's necessarily enough here if that was just, like, your thing to go ahead and jump into Project Cars 2. But I do think it makes a interesting little addition. And then the fact that there is snow in this game that you can put on any track at any time. Therefore, you can go ahead and make it, you know, you get more gain to it with those cars uh, compared to uh, Dirt Rally. Although I will say the AI is kind of janky because it just basically standards a, follows a standard, you know, circuit style line. As in they're not really going sideways, which means that they're kind of really weird to race against. Uh, so it's something that you're probably going to want to do more so online. Uh, and there's no heat racing functionality, uh, which is a big deal for for Rallycross. That's kind of a shame. But uh, otherwise, Rallycross, pretty fun. Next up, Oval Racing. Yeah, if Oval Racing is your jam, don't even bother with Project Cars 2 because it's just not worth it at all. Uh, you get Texas Motor Speedway, Daytona, and Indianapolis. You know, you get the Super Speedway wings for the Indy car. You get the, you know, NASCAR style, but you can't call it NASCAR. Ford Fusion, Generation 6 stock car. A uh, bunch of historic Indy 500 content. But, you know, the lack of tracks, as well as the fact that it's not looking like it's particularly popular online. There's not a bunch of content there. The AI doesn't handle it particularly well. You know, it, there's no you know, safety car, yellow flags, full course yellows, whatever you want to call it in your regional dialect, which means that basically any wreck on an oval is just days of thunder, carnage, and that's all you can do about it. It's just, it's something there because they originally had mentioned it for Project Cars 1, and then they didn't deliver on it for these reasons, so they delivered it this time, just that way people wouldn't complain about it, but it's it's nothing more than just checking a feature on the back of the box. Don't consider it anything more. Next up is a couple of car and class selections that I'd like to uh, talk about here. Uh, if anybody from Slightly Mad Studios happens to be watching this video or happens to have made it this far in this video, if they did watch it, can we please just have the ability to select which cars we're going to race against in an AI race? You know, it would actually add a good bit of functionality because it would really be nice to drop that Lamborghini Diablo from the mid to late 90s out of the GTO class designed for cars from like the 1980s. It just kind of sticks out like a sore thumb right there as well as the fact that right now it is bugged out on the IndyCar and Group C side of things. Both the IndyCar obviously has the super speedway wings. The Group C cars also have the Le Mans version of the car uh, which obviously low drag, tiny wings designed to go really fast, really tall gearing. You know, it's great that you have both the aero kits for the Indy car as well as the specific Le Mans versions for for the Group C cars. However, as it is right now, when you do a Indy car class race or a Group C class race, it spawns in all of the Indy cars, all of the Group C cars, which means that you end up with, you know, long tail Porsche 962s and a 
obviously high downforce circuits or you, know, you end up with oval super speedway winged Indy cars racing at Sonoma. It, it doesn't make sense. It's a mixed match of the field. It shouldn't happen. It's mystifying that it's happening in the release version of the game. Hopefully it's something that will be fixed because otherwise your only option to prevent that is to more or less just do identical car races which means that for the indy car for example you know only racing the honda indy cars against the honda indy cars because they're actually listed as two different cars so you need to have that class working it's it's puzzling and speaking of the indy car here specifically um yeah there's kind of an issue in that they allow you to run the red and black compound tires at the same time it's great that they have the you know alternate red sidewall tires as well as the black tires uh, which are the standard harder compound you know and, and they've done that and it works well you know you, you can tell obviously when you got the reds or the blacks on but um, the game allows you to put different tires at different corners so you can you know just run a red tire on the left front and run the rest blacks or put reds on the right front and the left rear and then put the blacks on the other one which it should not allow you to do uh, and I also imagine that applies to basically any other series that has multiple tire compounds. There's also an option in the menus to force a mandatory pit stop, which means that well, obviously a pit stop is mandatory. However, there is no rules available to make switching tire compounds necessary, as it would be in IndyCar racing, obviously. But um, beyond that, there's also the fact that mandatory pit stops are right now locked to races determined by lap count rather than time which is kind of weird because I think you would do timed races that you would want to have mandatory pit stops but I imagine it's some issue with the AI or something but maybe they could work on that for the future then there is also the penalty system which oh boy the penalty system in this game is a mess to say the least I appreciate that they tried. I understand it's incredibly difficult, but sometimes you're just better off not even opening up Pandora's box there. Uh, you know, I've had races that I've done on the line where, uh, you know, I got a clip in here actually, where for whatever reason the lights don't display on, on my screen for a standing start, so I'm queuing off of everyone else literally being the last guy to leave the line but yet somehow I'm giving a given a jump start penalty uh, and forced to do a drive through which never clears out for some reason because the whole thing got glitched uh, there's also a clip that from Daytona with the stock car and you know half the field is flying through the air there's no yellows because there's no yellow flags in this game obviously so I'm just like, okay, well, I'm just going to drop to the apron, well up the inside, and just hammer down and be done with it, avoid everything, and carry on. But then the game gives me a penalty and tells me to drop back to, like, 10th place or whatever, when 10th place was literally flying through the air and is wrecked out of the race. What, what do you mean slow down and give up the position back to the guy who's who's now DNFing? Like, what's... What's that? And then there is the car-to-car -car contact, which is, again, very hit and miss. When you absolutely smash the snot out of someone, it seems like the game doesn't really seem to particularly care all that much. But when you go ahead and, uh, quote-unquote, get them a little loose coming out of the corner, the game seems to just absolutely throw a hissy fit and basically says, no, you just go park in the pits right now. <laughs> like... It is just all over the place there. Track limits and lap time invalidations, obviously very important for qualifying. Uh, sometimes it will invalidate your lap if you run like an inch wide. Sometimes it just doesn't seem to care at all. And again, it, this whole system, the whole penalty system, I understand the difficulties, but it's just not to a point where I would say it's something that actually makes the game better and you're better off more or less just turning it off except for things like the jump start penalties although even that the <laughs> went wrong but you know the major infractions rather than relying on that to actually officiate your race a little bit more another thing triple screen setup is actually supported and doable within the game obviously I don't have a triple screen setup so I can't really comment as to how well that works but uh, that was something that Project Cars 1 was lacking and was said to be a feature that would be coming in a patch. 
that never came. So thank goodness the patch for Project Cars 1 has triple screen support. Hey, it may not affect me directly, but I emphasize with you. Or empathize with you. <laughs> Moving on to virtual reality, though, I have to say I was pretty underwhelmed with virtual reality in this game. Maybe it's because other games have me spoiled, or maybe it's just because it's not particularly good. I really don't know, but I came away underwhelmed to the point where it's actually kind of a tough decision as to do I want to race on my monitor or do I want to race in virtual reality. I don't have that problem for any other racing game at all. But, uh, you know, for one, the, the things I do like, you know, is the fact that the graphic settings are specific to the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive as well. Uh, and then your monitor settings are specific to your monitor. So whichever screen you're playing on is the graphic settings that you're going to pull up. Uh, which is very nice because you're obviously going to want to run different settings for different display devices because you have different goals there. You know, you hit 75 FPS on a monitor, everything's perfectly fine. You do that on a VR device, it's dropping down to 45 frames per second, which is just not nearly as enjoyable. All of the menus are navigable in virtual reality. Basically, it pops up with the main menu just kind of floating there in space. Uh, in black space sort of as like a monitor in front of your face more or less and you know what it works it's straightforward it's standard uh, there's no problems from that standpoint uh, you can also use your head uh, to go ahead and select options just by kind of using it as like a crosshair uh, and if you hover over something providing you have the option enabled obviously you can automatically select that without having to reach any buttons or anything like that which depending on your setup very well could be a very good feature but where the wheels fell off for Virtual Reality and Project Cars 2 for me is really the gameplay itself. Uh, first of all, I've noticed some issues that seem to almost be like the headset losing tracking. However, I've never had any headset losing tracking issues with any of the other games that I play at my desk. So I find it very bizarre that it would be just Project Cars 2 where I have tracking issues. Uh, yeah. So maybe there's a bug, maybe there's a glitch, maybe it doesn't affect everyone, maybe it is something specific with my setup, however I've had it in this game specifically, so therefore I must mention it. Uh, next up, it seems like the image itself just lacks punch, lacks saturation, lacks contrast, it just seems kind of flat, uh, you know, comparing to a monitor. And granted, I have a pretty swanky monitor, but... You know, this very well could be an Oculus Rift specific issue in the display in there, but it just didn't have that same pop, even comparing the same graphic settings. Uh, and then there is the fact that the textures that they've used throughout the game, you know, especially in the car interiors, are just very flat looking. I'm not talking about contrast, I would just mean depth. They don't have a lot of texture to them, everything just looks very, very clean and clinical. Uh, you know, for example, you know, comparing to, you know, the iRacing IndyCar, for example, comparing the Project Cars 2 IndyCar, like, it's not even a contest. Like, the iRacing IndyCar, I'm so freaking into. Like, everything feels, looks freaking real. You know, the buttons, I like, I, I almost want to sometimes reach out and, like, press the buttons on the steering wheel and then I remind myself, oh, wait, no, it doesn't actually work that way. But then comparing to the Project Cars 2 version, you know, the LCD on the steering wheel just looks like it's put on with, like, you know, sticker label tape. It just looks very, very flat. The shift lights just look like they're kind of pasted on and they don't really have any sort of illusion of depth. You know, some of the car cockpit interior materials, like the plastics that they've used, like just look very flat. And overall, it really doesn't help to sell the illusion of virtual reality. Uh, and I think that's been my main issue. It does also seem like there may be some scaling issues, at least to me from my perspective. It seemed like everything was just a little bit too small out of the box. There was a in-game option to change the world scaling. I went in and scaled it up about 15%, and that seemed to work a little bit better and seemed to be about the right size that it should be. Although I do find it odd that, again, Project Cars 2 specifically and not any other racing game. So... There's that, but yeah, it, it's functional, it works, uh, you know, there's not necessarily any problems, you know, even the little glitchy tracking that I sometimes seem to experience isn't like a, I can't use this, there's nothing that I couldn't use, but comparing to how the game looks on a monitor, sometimes it is 
you know, sort of tough for me to decide, do I want to play in virtual reality or do I want to play on a monitor, even though, like, I don't have that same issue with any other game. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird. Probably. And yes, we're only 30 minutes into this. I'm finally going to talk about multiplayer. This will be the last thing, and then we can be done with this video, and that will be that. But, uh... First of all, I want to be right up front here. I'm saving this to the end because I kind of have to talk through a couple of different things and sort of explain some of my thoughts here. Uh, and this is something that we won't know the end result of until months into the future because the ratings need to establish themselves and everything needs to equalize and we need to figure out the system and all that. So I'm not panning the system here. I'm not writing it off. Don't get me wrong here. I'm just pointing out a couple of things that I think could improve the overall experience. So for those of you guys who don't know, Project Cars 2 has a competitive license that they call it. Uh, it basically works very much the same as the system in iRacing where you have your you know, driver safety rating and then you have your skill rating. Uh, you know, it tracks you know, your, your negative incidents, you know, things like running off the track and smashing into other cars uh, as well as who do you beat, who do you get beaten by and you know, how do you move up the ranks? Um, and I think it very well could work well. I hope it works well. But I also have to take a step back and say that so far I haven't experienced anything that's like above and beyond usual pub server racing. So I don't know if it's done anything quite yet. And I think there are a couple of issues here. First of all, clean racing is a mentality. Clean racers do not need to be told to race cleanly. I think many of us would agree on that. And for them, this system will largely be something there in the background, the same same as the case with the iRacing system. You know, as long as you don't do anything nefarious and screw yourself over or smash into stuff, you know, you ain't going to have a problem. You know, and, and that's what the system is designed to work as, and that's how the system does work. But the difference is the system has to tell people that they should have the mentality of clean racing. It's not the people who are already clean racers that are the problem for the system. The problem for the system is the people who aren't clean racers. You know, for example, the people joining iRacing or searching out the the minnow rating or minor rating, whatever the heck it is, servers for a subtle Corsa, they're going there specifically for clean racing, you know, for the most part, and they're going in with that mindset. Whereas Project Cars 2 has to create that mindset and the presence of this system does not just simply snap a finger and make that happen. And I think one of the big things that they could really do to improve the way the system works as it is currently implemented is actually go ahead and publish the incidents on screen. Same thing that iRacing does. Because I think at that point, it goes from something other than, oh yeah, there's just like this number in my top right corner of my screen in the menus that tells me my license and everything and how good I am or how bad I am. But then it transfers into, oh wow, I just smashed into that car and I got dinged for, you know, however many incident points or however the system actually calculates things. And it just kind of sets off one of those alarms that's like, you know what, I should probably not do that, you know. It's sort of like that uh, positive reinforcement or something like that or negative reinforcement. I don't know what you'd call it in this case, but just to get people to realize that their actions have a little bit more weight. And that's something that the system doesn't do currently that I think the system really will need to do to reach its full potential. And then there is also the fact that one of the big things that they tout is the fact that you'll be able to, you know, control what drivers are able to join your race, you know, through multiplayer filters and minimum requirements, which is fine and dandy. And I think very well could end up being the thing that makes the whole system work months on down the line. Don't get me wrong here. But you also have to ask the question, being realistic here, this is a racing sim. You know, every racing sim is subject to terrible participation because not a lot of people are capable of jumping in and driving. You know, especially some of the more difficult cars. Will it actually be practical to go ahead and say that drivers under this rating won't be eligible to join or will you naturally end up having to let those drivers into your race anyways just so that way there's actually cars on the grid and also a flip side along this same line of thinking this actually might have a positive effect for some of those you know racing groups that get together from various websites or whatever uh, where they can actually allow people to join into their races that really are 
kind of like a league right now, but they're not actually a league in that no one actually cares. They just race together that way. Everybody kind of races cleanly because they all agree to race cleanly. So for those people, they might be able to restrict the ratings and allow, you know, basically anyone over those ratings to join in a race because the people that are, you know, at those ratings are people who are going to be racing cleanly and therefore they won't need to password protect their servers. They can let anyone join over those ratings and therefore, you know, everybody has bigger grids to race against and better quality racing. So I don't know. We'll see how it plays out. I'm actually very excited to see how this plays out because... You know, the iRacing system, it works the way it does, and the whole thing is built around it. The whole iRacing ecosystem is built around the ratings, whereas here with Project Cars 2, it's kind of an interesting, you know, social experiment, if you will, where they've taken just a standard online racing game, you know, just like every other racing game out there besides iRacing, and then dropped in this big licensing system and how that all works, and it'll be interesting to see does it have an effect and does it like push everything towards more like an iRacing type of experience or does it alternatively just end up being something that everyone more or less ends up ignoring and is totally irrelevant in three months time outside of you know esports circle jerking so with that said we're gonna wrap things up here project cars 2 in some ways it's pretty good in some ways there's still some stuff to be done is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. I just talked for about 35 minutes about this game, so if you can't figure out what my opinions are on this game, uh, I can't help you. So, that's that. Roll on some audio. Hope you guys enjoyed. All right, bye.